I'm about to start the live. Okay, we're about to go live. I'll let you know when we're when we are there. We're there. Good morning and welcome everyone. We'll give just a couple of minutes for folks to sign on and we'll get started uh, shortly. If you were to take out the little orange thing around this little ball here, those of you who just joined us, if you could please enter your name, outlet, or organization you're affiliated with and location in the chat, we would appreciate it. Just get a sense of who's in the room. Thank you. Also, if you are not speaking, could you please mute your mics? I see a couple more folks connecting. We'll give them a second and then we'll get started. Okay, let's get started. I see a full room. Um, and thank you for those of you who are entering your name, outlet, uh, organization, and location in the chat. We appreciate it. My name is Nora Preciado. Thank you for being with us today. I'm the managing director and partner at CUNY Strategies. And we are here today to present a report that shows how cities in LA County that enacted a local cannabis tax are reporting and spending that revenue. This report, Show Me the Money, Cannabis Revenue and Cities in Los Angeles County, is a joint effort by Youth Forward and Catalyst California. And it looks at how cities spend local cannabis taxes and the transparency that is needed to ensure that revenue benefits communities. With us today, we have a stellar lineup. First, Jim Ketty, Executive Director at Youth Forward, a youth policy organization that works for the well being of children and youth through a progressive policy. We have Mai Kalfani King, Senior Research and Policy Analyst at Catalyst California, who designed the research for this great report. We have Adwa Achianu, Policy Advocate at Youth Forward, who will speak to some of the populations they work with. We also have with us Yasmin Imani Magmorin. Vice Mayor of Culver City, who will speak from an elected official's perspective in support of the recommendations contained in the report. And we have Eden Avera, Prevention Manager at Community Coalition, who will share with us how the report recommendations can lead to healing in communities hurt by the war on drugs. 
And without further ado, I will turn it over to Jim Keddy to get us started. Jim. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I think some of you are familiar that uh, uh, our organization, Youth Forward, has been very active on cannabis policy and specifically on efforts to redirect cannabis tax revenue to communities that have impacted, been impacted by the war on drugs. And um, uh, I'm gonna wait for my slides to pop up here so I don't repeat myself. You scared me there for a second. I thought you were going to do it at the meeting. I'm going, okay, I can't do much more than this. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So um, since you 2018. You scared me there for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so since 2018. I'm just like, wait a minute. <clears throat> I, I, I'm already fighting with my boss. He's like, what are we doing? Bobby, meetings? could what you please doing? mute yourself? I'm like, okay, I'm working, dude, I'm working. Okay, all right. So since uh, since 2018, uh, Youth Forward has been working with state agencies to develop the Prop 64 grant programs. We've brought forward recommendations to those agencies and have advocated for um, certain elements in those grant programs. Uh, we are happy for those of you on the call who would like to learn more about how the state is using its cannabis revenue, please feel free to contact us. And then we've also been assisting organizations in Los Angeles uh, for the last uh, four or five years and become in helping them become aware of the state funding sources. And to date, CBOs in LA have raised over $86 million from uh, the state Prop 64 grant programs. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so in 2016, as everyone knows, the voters approved the legislation of cannabis. Uh, Prop 64 mandated the state to spend uh, revenue in, for certain purposes, including investments in youth substance abuse prevention, public health. There's also a significant amount of money from state cannabis tax revenues going to child care. And of course, in the Prop 64 campaign, the governor and the advocates behind the campaign made the promise that the measure would result in less criminalization and more in investments in communities harmed by the war on drugs. Next slide. And uh, so this is a, an important point and uh, uh, I think key to the conversation we're having today is that while Prop 64 included language that gave direction to the state on how to spend state cannabis tax revenue, the measure was silent on how local governments should treat cannabis tax policy. So that means that local governments that allow for legal businesses in their jurisdiction, they can put taxes in place. They have to do that through a ballot measure, but they have complete discretion over how to spend the money. So while the state, uh, Prop 64 gave guidelines to the state, local governments can spend cannabis tax revenue um, however they see fit. And what we're seeing at Youth Forward is that hundreds of cities across the state are collecting revenue from cannabis businesses. Uh, the report you'll see today that uh, we did in partnership with Catalyst California, this is a second report. In 2020, we did do a statewide report that had information on the cities at that time, back in 2020, that had passed cannabis taxes and were collecting revenue. This report today is kind of much more of a drill down on, um, on what's happening in Los Angeles. And uh, one thing I'd like to mention before I pass it back to Nora is that here in the city of Sacramento, we did pass a ballot measure that requires our city to spend a, por a, a percentage of its cannabis revenue on child and youth services in our impacted neighborhoods. And, and uh, we are, as an organization, we're trying to encourage elected officials and local community leaders to um, follow that that path, uh, not only here in Sacramento, other cities as well, that are redirecting cannabis revenue to children and youth services and to community reinvestment. Um, so I'll turn it back to Nora. Thank you, Jim. And now we have Mike Alfani King, who will speak about the methodology and findings of this report. Mike. Good morning, thank you all for being here. I'll wait for the slides to pop up. We're first gonna go through the methodology and some of the research questions that guided this analysis. Great, we can go to the next slide. So some of the methodology, we developed three research questions. Uh, we review publicly available local budgets, 
and local cannabis policy and programs. We synthesized that data and had an analysis and then also discussed those findings with community members. Um, our first research question was, how do cities within the greater Los Angeles area that have passed cannabis tax measure spend those cannabis revenues? And then the next research question we developed with the backdrop of knowing that local governments spend a good portion of their general fund dollars on law enforcement and public safety, are local governments spending their cannabis tax revenues on law enforcement? And if so, how much of that revenue is going towards those agencies? And then lastly, knowing the aims and goals of Proposition 64, really wanting to correct the harms done to the most impacted communities based on past um, cannabis policy, we asked our local cannabis dollars being used by local governments to promote equity and to support individuals and communities most harmed by past cannabis policies. Next slide, please. Um, so some of our overall cannabis spending trends that we saw are that local budgets lack transparency on how cannabis dollars are allocated. When local governments do disclose cannabis allocation, it only shows a portion of those revenues that come in. And we'll go a little bit more in a graphic on the next slide. Um, but when we do see how cannabis dollars are being spent, we put them into a different bucket. So we have administrative, which is spending that supports the implementation of cannabis policy and or general city management and operations. We have programmatic spending, which is spending that goes towards care-based services and then enforcement spending, which we're categorizing as any spending that is directly or indirectly benefiting law enforcement agencies and their priorities. So when we talk about limited transparency and budgets lacking transparency, um, this graphic really uh, starts to form that picture. So here we have all of the cities that we reviewed in this report. Um, in our first column, we have revenue information and we see that all the cities gave revenue information. When we start to go into spending categories, we see less check marks. Um, so only three out of the nine cities offered any spending information in their budgets. And that was Bellflower, Long Beach, and Los Angeles. And only Long Beach gave information into all the spending categories. So what that's telling us is that local jurisdictions need to do more in providing information for where these dollars are going. Our local officials have the obligation um, to really keep their residents um, and constituents informed so we can have really strong budget advocacy. Um, so the answer isn't simply those cities didn't spend money in those categories, um, and we'll get into that in the next slide. So here we have a graphic going into detail of the actual spending information that we got. So we have Bellflower, Long Beach, and Los Angeles. Our first column is total revenues. So that is the cannabis dollars each city saw for the fiscal year of 2020. Um, we then go into the spending categories of administrative, enforcement, and programmatic. And then our last column is total expenditures. But if we look at our first column, which is our total revenues, and our last, which is total expenditures, those numbers don't match, right? So Bellflower saw upwards of 1.4 million come in. But when you look at the budget, you only see that they spent around 300,000. Um, so that's not telling us the story of how the rest of that money was being spent. So the answer can't simply be, you know, these jurisdictions just weren't spending in administrative spending or weren't spending in enforcement because we don't know where this money is going. Um, and a point we're gonna get to a little later, if we look at Long Beach or just the enforcement category in general, it looks like enforcement spending is the smallest amount of spending, um, but we're gonna see that that picture isn't a full picture. Um, we can go to the next slide. So going into a little bit more detail of the trends that we're seeing within each category. Um, so for administrative spending, we see that cities using cannabis dollars for administrative purposes for both cannabis and non-cannabis uses. Non-cannabis spending is spending that goes towards general city administrative purposes unrelated to cannabis policy or implementation, implementation costs. We see administrative dollars benefiting enforcement priorities and we're labeling that as indirect enforcement spending. And that means that we're looking at how cities allocate funds to non-law enforcement departments, um, but ultimately that's the staffing position, partnering with law enforcement to push enforcement priorities. And an example of that is an administrative position in a city's clerk's office 
whose main function is to support enforcement of, let's say, illegal cannabis businesses or other enforcement priorities. Moving into programmatic trends, the details of programmatic spending were limited across jurisdictions. And then in the small cases where we saw programmatic spending, we don't see specifics on how those dollars are being used. An example of that uh, we can see in Long Beach in their fiscal year 2022 budget, it shows that the city allocated around 2.5 million for their racial equity program and around 3.6 million for their public health and safety program. But beyond those line items, the document doesn't provide any staffing or program details. We don't know like which part of the city it's serving, um, and any of those uh, details. And then lastly, enforcement, some trends we saw were that uh, cannabis dollars expand law enforcement infrastructure in different ways when we think about how general fund dollars overly benefit uh, law enforcement agencies when we think about how ballot measures were worded in language. Uh, cities prioritize putting police and public safety in those ballot measures uh, to make sure cannabis dollars were spent on those activities. Um, and then also the full picture of enforcement spending is complicated. So it may look on its face that cannabis dollars are not going towards enforcement spending. Uh, but as we know, like looking at how budgets are prioritizing enforcement, naming it and, and the highlights and accomplishments of really cracking down on illegal cannabis businesses and how we know like funding is being indirectly tied to enforcement, that there's a bigger picture of enforcement spending that's not um, so blatant in the document. Next slide, please. So wrapping up into our findings that connect to our research questions, we found that local governments are not being transparent in how the cannabis dollars are being spent. And that makes it difficult for advocates to know where these dollars are going and therefore mobilized. Local governments are only spending a fraction of cannabis revenues on cannabis related spending. Local governments are using cannabis revenues for general city purposes and enforcement. And cities are not making large investments into care based community services and programming. And then enforcement related spending is being undercounted. And then our next slide. So, some recommendations that we wanted to uplift are that. Incorporating participatory budgeting in the distribution of cannabis funds, this really empowers residents and connects local governments more directly to their constituents to find solutions. Improve cannabis revenue transparency and accountability for true budget equity and advocacy, local jurisdictions need to make local budgets accessible. And then invest cannabis revenues in community programs for the most impacted. Local governments need to follow state agencies' lead and invest in specific programming to benefit communities most harmed by past racialized cannabis policy. And some strategies to do that are cannabis dollar set aside and fixed percentages that really maximize the amount of dollars we can be putting into the communities most harmed. Thank you, and I can pass it back to Nora. Thank you, Mike, for that um, snapshot of what uh, the great report you all put out today um, really shows. And next we have Adjua Achianu, who will speak about examples of cities um, that have created policies that reinvest local cannabis taxes in care programs. Adjua? Sure, thank you, Nora. And I'll just wait for that slide. So yeah, so we'll start with Santa Cruz. So in Santa Cruz in November of 2021, voters approved Measure A. Measure A amended the Santa Cruz City Charter to allocate 20% of the revenue from the city's cannabis business tax to youth in early childhood development services and programs. This effort was led by um, um, council member and by council members as well as by local children's organizations. So it's definitely possible. That's something that we really just wanted to showcase with the inclusion of this conversation is just letting folks know that it is possible for local governments to invest in youth and community reinvestment. Another example is here in our home city in Sacramento. So since 2018, SAC Kids First, a coalition of child and youth advocates have been organizing to create a children's fund in the city budget. SAC Kids First, um, Youth Forward also serves as a coordinating entity for them. So we had a huge success last year. 
So in November of 2022, voters approved the Child and Youth Health Safety Act, which requires the city to invest the equivalent of 40% of its cannabis tax in child and youth services annually. So just as my mentioned, fixed percentages is what we're looking for. So that's why we've got that 40%. So how does that play out? So currently, Sacramento is collecting about $20 million annually from our local cannabis tax. So the ballot measure projects that that's going to generate about $9 to $10 million in addition to the existing city spending on children and youth services. So that's an extra $9 to $10 million that's going to go back to youth. We also implemented a five-year strategic plan and evaluation strategy, prioritizing youth most impacted by poverty, violence, and trauma. Again, this is looking to undo some of the harm from the war on drugs. So we wanted to ensure that these funds are really being spent in ways that, you know, they were advocated for. How can they really undo that harm? So every year we'll be able to evaluate the strategy and make sure that we're prioritizing the right group of youth. Thank you. Thank you, Adra. And up next, we have Yasmin Imani McMorin, Vice Mayor of Culver City, who will speak from the perspective on an elected official about how the report recommendations can help cities in LA County. Vice Mayor McMorin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am coming to y'all from an unconventional place in town in Culver City. So if there's a little background noise, please excuse that. Uh, it's really wonderful to be with y'all this morning. I'm really grateful to Jim and Ottawa from uh, Youth Forward, as well as Catalyst California, the other panelists, and of course, the community members that are present on the call. Uh, uh, my name is Yasmin Amani McMorin. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, in my day job, I serve as the Director of Education Equity for the Children's Defense Fund in California. Um, and today I'm uh, speaking to you Ooh, I guess it could be dual hat, but uh, in my experience as a vice mayor of Culver City, uh, I became vice mayor in December of 2022. So, and I've been on the council since 2020. Um, but I'm really excited about the opportunity to discuss this report or show me the money. Um, I fundamentally, you know, I ran in 2020, I ran on a mandate of uh, divesting from the police 50% and investing in. Uh, community resources. Um, and, you know, uh, Culver City is historically a sundown town. And so, um, and even, you know, even more recent than that uh, history of Culver City being founded uh, for white folks, there's been a lot of uh, tension. And, you know, one of the police officers that was involved in the Rodney King uh, incident was later after that incident hired at TCPD. And there's just a, a history here of, um, uh, maybe uh, the city not being as equitable. Uh, in 2021, we passed a resolution acknowledging our sundown town, uh, but we have a long ways to go in terms of really incorporating equity, really ensuring that folks in our community who live, work, learn, and play here really have an opportunity to thrive. One other thing, and it's it's funny, we're in the middle of uh, the beginning of our work plan processes in the city. Uh, we started yesterday and we'll continue today. Um, the work plans are pretty much more of the same. 30 to 40 percent of our budget looks like it's probably going to go to police, 20 to 30 percent uh, to fire, and everyone else kind of gets the scraps. Um, and I mean, we're just not investing in a care first way. Um, and, and that is a choice because policy uh, is a choice. We have a choice to invest in equitable systems. We have a choice to have uh, transparency in how, how our dollars are spent. We also, unfortunately, do not have a participatory budgeting process right now. And so normally we get about anywhere from maybe 15 to 25 comments or so. I mean, it's normally pretty robust. We had about five comments yesterday in our, in our budgeting process. So folks are really um, not invited in. They kind of come after the budget and the, and the monies have been assigned. And I know we have significant cannabis revenues here and, and they're just not being allocated in a way that the community wants to see in youth, in our parks, in housing and supports for our unhoused neighbors. That's been a really hot topic here uh, in the LA area. Um, and so I love what happened uh, in the measure in Sacramento, would love to potentially do something like that uh, down here. But I, 
you know, I'm excited about this report, excited to uh, bring this up to, to my colleagues in the community here in Culver City. But I just wanted to say, you know, now is the time, you know, it's, it's never a better time to make investments where they will have the, well, they will really get to the root of some of our issues and work to um, sort of repair some of those previous harms and ensure that folks have the tools that they need to thrive. So again, I'm just really grateful for this opportunity to uh, raise my voice in support of investments in this way um, and, and look forward to all that's to come from this report. And thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Sorry for that noise in the back. <laughs> thank you, Vice Mayor McMorin. Now I, we will hear from Eden Aveva, Prevention Manager at Community Coalition, COCO, about how healing from the war on drugs happens through art engagement actions in communities that are using state Prop 64 funds and how they could be increased by similar investments from cities. Eden. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Eden. I use she, her pronouns. Um, as some folks may be aware, South Los Angeles, which is a community that is still feeling the effects of the war on drugs, has experienced continuous disinvestment since the early 90s. Um, community Coalition, um, an organization that was founded in utilizing communities, organizing as a prevention strategy, um, was um, intentional in using um, in was intentional in launching our community members input um, on ways that they see um, re on was very intentional in ensuring that our community members voices were um, a part of the conversation on reinvestment in South Los Angeles. One of our earliest prevention strategies um, which um, was dedicated to investing in youth leadership, which is known as SEIA, or South Central Youth Empowered Through Action, has utilized Prop 64 funds which are state funds um, to, again, um, reinvigorate and reactivate our youth in um, the community, in the community that they live in, and also um, increasing their access to all arts and other cultural assets. Some of the art activations that we did um, using these Prop 64 funds were PowerFest, as you see below, which is a large scale alcohol and drug free event. Um, dedicated to highlighting community assets and resources here in Los Angeles. Um, some of the things that are included are live performances, art activations, wellness workshops, and more. Um, on the next slide, you'll see um, one of the other art activations that we did was a South LA bike tour. Um, this was a creative way at engaging youth in asset mapping and understanding the significance in various historical sites here in Los, um, South LA. Um, this program has continued to ground both our youth and other community members, including um, our elders in the community and the deep history of their built environment. The last um, activation that we did um, that was also connected to this was a pop-up exhibit um, at um, the MLK Freedom Festival, and it's a pop-up exhibit that we continue to utilize. Um, it's really dedicated to highlighting some of the gaps in funding, enrollment, and commitment to ensuring that South LA schools are adequately funded. Um, we hope to continue to host this pop-up and highlight some of the inequitable funding that we see in South LA schools um, and the under-enrollment that we're seeing as well. Um, we have continued to utilize this strategy um, to highlight other historical events as, as well that have affected our Black and Brown residents living in South LA, like redlining, um, amongst other um, historical inequities. Um, we hope that cities like Los Angeles continue to incorporate cannabis tax revenues at the city level to invest in communities like South LA that have been affected by the war on drugs. Prop 64 changed the way that many organizations across the state of California provided programs and services to the communities um, that have been intentionally that have been intentionally disinvested in. Um, we hope to see communities across California like South LA give that intentional investment um, that they deserve. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Eden. Uh, thank you for sharing those beautiful um, pictures capturing um, what we can do when we invest in community, especially our youth. I'd like to now open the conference to questions uh, from uh, journalists accompanying us today um, and others. Please introduce yourself and your outlet or affiliation. Um, you can probably just unmute yourself. Any questions for our uh, report authors and others who were instrumental in putting together this report?
Any questions from anyone in the audience, um, either for Youth Forward, Catalyst California, um, Eden, um, who is obviously working here um, on the ground very closely with community um, and others. Jim, before I turn it over to Tessie to close us out, uh, any uh, last uh, thoughts you want to share? You're on mute. I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, we will be uh, doing more outreach and engagement around the report findings in Los Angeles. So uh, you'll be um, hearing from us uh, both. Uh, we're hoping to do a webinar uh, to do get into the report in more detail as well as to do an in-person convening in Los Angeles to talk about cannabis tax revenue and strategies that we might pursue to redirect these dollars to the most impacted communities. So, We do have a question in the chat um, for anyone that wants to um, chime in. What's the best messaging that's worked to invest in youth through cannabis dollars? And I'm assuming that's messaging with local elected officials or other decision makers best messaging that's worth. Yeah, I can uh, jump in on that. Um, given our experience here in Sacramento, I think there are two messages that resonate um, perhaps with two different voter populations. Certainly there's a message that resonates around uh, repairing harm from the war on drugs and recognizing that cannabis uh, policy in the past was such a big driver of mass incarceration. And rather than treat cannabis revenue just like it's any other revenue that comes to a city, to treat it as something that should be uh, used with intention and with uh, uh, a racial equity lens and consideration of reinvestment in communities that have been harmed. And then I think the second argument, which I, I believe is going to be growing in people's awareness, is just like uh, the state and uh, we collect revenue from tobacco sales, we have a tobacco tax in place, and we use funds from the tobacco tax for youth prevention and education and uh, treatment, uh, we should be treating cannabis revenue similar to how we treat tobacco tax revenue. And I think uh, I think many of you on the in this on the zoom are aware of as the cannabis industry becomes more commercialized, more corporatized, as it creates products with really high levels of THC products that are more addictive and that create greater risk for youth mental health. I think we're all going to be having more and more conversation around reinvesting cannabis revenues, um, similar to how we reinvest uh, we invest tobacco tax revenues. So. Thank you, Jim. And we have another um, question in the chat for all the speakers. Um, what are some of the ways that you have invited community to be an active part in advocating for investing cannabis dollars into community and youth services? How have you really involved community in advocating? Anyone can start from our speakers. I can start. Um... From our perspective, um, in utilizing the dollars we already have, those activations and programs were actually based out of a member um, arts council. So community members actually influenced and let us know what it is that they were looking for for us to do um, with these specific funds, which we are very grateful um, and lucky to have their insight and input. Um, in inviting community members to be an active part in advocating for these cannabis dollars, um, originally with Prop 64, um, one of our teams. Um, went out into the community and really spoke to residents and community members about what Prop 64 would mean um, for California if it were if it were passed at the time. Um, and some of the ways that we um, advocate, some of the ways that we um, included them in this conversation was one, of course, through, through civic engagement. Um, and then also, of course, inviting our members and highlighting their, their voice and their narratives and different um, opportunities to speak with elected officials. And I'll go ahead and add in um, for some of the things. There's a few ways that we've actually invited community. So for that success story that we talked about here in Sacramento, 
a big part of that was creating relationships with the mayor and city council members here. We did have some pretty large scale community events. I'm sure we had well over 100 community members come out, youth included, and talk about why a children's fund in Sacramento would be important, what it would mean to them, and share their stories. So that's one way that we um, really included community in our Sacramento story. And in the um, culmination of this report, I actually did an interview with several community organizations in the Los Angeles area, um, Gente Organizada. Um, I did meet with Coco. We met with um, some Cal Pomona, Cal Pomona city workers. We met with at, le at least probably 16 or so different organizations, um, including some coalitions in there. So we actually met with and got a lot of community input because essentially that's, you know, what really drives this work. So I really appreciate the question is, you know, we don't really know where to invest in community without talking with community. So we definitely made sure that we did those interviews, that we really listened, that we noted the feedback that we were getting and that we included it in our report as well. Thank you, Eden and Angela. Um, we have another question in the chat from Alex Avila from Calonius. What is the best way people can express their concerns and actively make changes in their communities? Um, I think I can take some of this. Um, really call your council member, call your supervisor, like be in the meeting. They should know your face, they should know your name. Um, we do a lot of budget advocacy and budget advocacy training um, so really connecting with community members, community organizers, so they can learn how to read a budget. How can you actively, you know, make public comment? How can you be heard? Um, when in the process should you be talking to the department heads or talking to your elected officials so you're not at the end of the budget cycle asking for them to divert money that's already allocated? Um, so really, you know, the more the merrier, like you, your friends, your coworkers, like really get your voice heard, talk, call, email, um, all of your elected officials when you have a problem, like they are here to serve you and there shouldn't be any discomfort in you making your voice heard for, you, for them to know like where you want your money to be spent, how you want your communities to look like um, and thrive. Um, there is another question um, from Fanny Stefania. Is there a policy that also addresses the investment of cannabis dollars in prevention the way alcohol and tobacco do? Is there a policy that addresses the investment of those dollars in prevention? Yeah, in Prop 64, there was language that directs um, some state revenue to prevention, um, certainly not to the extent that we saw with the tobacco tax measures. Um, but again, at the local level, cities have complete discretion and are not required to reinvest any of those revenues in prevention or in public health. Any other questions? Um, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, put them in the chat. I'll give it... Um, one more second. Nora, if I could just say one more thing about the engagement. I just want to plus, 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 plus one to what Diana said about uh, fees, because people are uh, taking up space uh, in the council meetings. Um, you know, uh, powerful people, people with means, they're getting the meetings, they are, you know, developers, folks are talking to uh, electives. And so folks have just as much right, if not more, uh, to, to, to be in those rooms. Um, and I know it can be intimidating. I'm an attorney by trade and I'll never forget going to my first council meeting. It made me feel like the first time I went to court because it's kind of intimidating when you walk in and everybody's looking at you. But you have just as much right to be there. Your voice is so, so important. And so just please uh, don't be deterred if you need a friend to come with you. Sometimes um, some folks have like, you know, their friends will come and stand next to them or their neighbors will stand alongside them so it doesn't feel so intimidating. But just please, you know, our governments should work on behalf of, you know, you all. Um, and for a long time, they've only at least, you know, only worked for the powerful, only worked for those who are connected. And so please, please, um, you know, we're, we're here for you all. So please, uh, please come, please send me emails, 
come to the Zoom or the Web WebExes because uh, we need to hear your voices. Thanks so much. We have a, a couple more questions. Um, um, I will, um, Jim, I will toss this one to you. Um, how do you address uh, those who say that taking these funds will actually increase um, crime in cities and communities? Um, I haven't seen any data that shows that uh, uh, cannabis businesses attract crime. Um, so I, um, there was a study done by UCLA a couple years ago to look at whether there's cannabis businesses attract crime, um, and there was no finding that uh, having cannabis businesses in a community leads to a, an increase in crime. Certainly, um, uh, there are uh, people, you know, folks who are wanting to see more funding for law enforcement could make that argument, but uh, at least from what I've seen in data, it's not really uh, based in reality. Um, and then I think there's a, a larger discussion around what does it mean to address crime and what are the best ways to do that through community-based approaches versus law enforcement. And I think that's a super important conversation to have in this context around cannabis as well. So. Thank you, Jim. And the, and there's, the, sorry. The earlier, yeah, in that earlier report we did in 2020, if you look, if you that's which you could find on our website, we did have a lot of data in that report that shows the massive growth in law enforcement over the last few decades, uh, growth that has really outpaced growth in population. So we're we're making a huge and massive investment in law enforcement at this moment in history and um, why we would be spending these new dollars to even expand that already huge investment it certainly doesn't make any sense to me, you know. Thank you, Jim. Um, we have one more question. Is there any movement to make our local governments provide transparency on cannabis spending and to start advocating for policies that would reallocate cannabis spending towards local prevention, youth, and community funding. Funding is there any movement to make local governments both be transparent and reallocate those dollars? I think you, we, we're certainly seeing movement in different parts of the state on that. And in the report, in addition to those Santa Cruz and Sacramento examples, there are. There's an example, there's an effort in Oakland called the Emerald New Deal. There's an effort underway currently in Fresno around that. So there's definitely movement. And the, there, there has been conversation in the city of Los Angeles about a ballot measure to redirect cannabis revenue, um, which was called, uh, uh, and that's also referenced in the report. Great. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, I will give it one more second. Um, and of course, you can always contact um, you forward, Jim, Adra, locally here at Eden, um, and others who are working on this issue very closely. I will turn it over to Teresa Borden. Um, she is Media Relations Director with Sunu Strategies to close us out today. I'd just like to thank everybody who was able to join us for um, this press conference and to and for the launch of this report. We are live streaming this um, via Youth Forward's Facebook page. So we would welcome any of and all of you all sharing um, that out so that we can make this more known across um, the region. Um, and we are also going to be uh, sending media the, a full copy of the press conference, as well as links to both reports um, by uh, Youth Forward and Catalyst uh, California. And uh, we will be as well sharing um, some other references, making folks available for interviews later in the day. So again, want to thank you all for your participation and all the questions and appreciate your joining us today.
Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.